Welcome to Glass Houses, a Billy Joel podcast. I'm Michael Grosvenor. And I'm Jack Frenino. Join us as we dig deep into Billy Joel's songs and history and what his music has meant to us. William Martin Joel had released three solo albums by the beginning of 1976. In many ways, however, that was the year he became the Billy we all know today. It was the year he recorded and released Turnstiles, finally winning his battle with CBS Records to cut an album with his touring band. That band, of course, was now almost entirely the classic Lords of 52nd Street lineup. By then, Billy and his wife Elizabeth had moved from California back to New York. In the process, he jettisoned any lingering West Coast singer-songwriter stylings for East Coast grit. There were more changes behind the scenes, too. While not as well known, these business moves and strategies played huge roles in his upcoming accomplishments. True stardom wouldn't come until the following year. But for now, we're diving deep into 1976 and the 12 months that primed Billy Joel for the decades of success to come. So here we are with 1976, which, as you may know, was another transformative year in Billy's career. This is the first year that the classic Lords of 52nd Street were assembled. He had a new album out. He had a new manager. There were so many things going on, and it was fun to peel back and see what was behind the scenes here. Yeah, you know, going in, we knew this was going to be a big year. Putting together some of these things, you realize just how it all really came together in a very short amount of time after these years of being in a few different bands, then having a botched debut, and then having a, yeah. what was almost a fluke hit, a flop of a third album. And then all of a sudden, in the span of just a few months, everything just coalesced and yeah. it was all systems go after that. Yeah, it really was. And you're right. It, it did happen relatively quickly because it was after the Street Life Serenader tour ended and Billy made his way back to New York within the following year. The career trajectory was on a much different path than it was coming out of that record. So we're going to get into all that in a second. But first, we're going to keep up on our New Year's resolution of reading listener emails on the podcast. Let's dive in. We've got two here. This first one is from Justin Aylett, and he writes, Just beginning to listen to your podcast. I started in the middle with the Greatest Hits retrospective episode. I love the episode and the Street Life Serenade episode. The only songs I like off Greatest Hits are The Night is Still Young and the versions they had of the live Say Goodbye to Hollywood. Besides that, I have all the songs already and kind of always enjoyed Billy's deep tracks and not the hits per se. Exceptions being Honesty and Captain Jack. Since I am so versed with this catalog from 71 to 93, I've been listening to Hour of the Wolf a lot lately, which is about 50% great, I'd say. <laughs> Even though it's the hassles, it's pretty much a Billy Joel album. Heavy piano, and he sings pretty much every song. Would love to hear your thoughts on that at some point. Awesome, Justin. Thank you for writing in. Yeah, it's funny that you came in on the Greatest Hits episode, since that seems to be the one you like the least. Uh, I think you're one of the only people who puts The Night is Still Young as one of their favorites. You you don't hear that one a lot. No, that's true. I, I've always liked that one a lot, too. And, you know, we, when we were talking about it on the episode, they served up the two new songs, and that mm -hmm. being one of them. And it was a mature yeah. Billy coming out of An Innocent Man, you know, so... I, I was like the uh, the direction Certainly. you went with it. But I really love this question about Hour of the Wolf because it really doesn't get a lot of attention. Um, it hasn't even got any from us yet at all. Uh, so that makes this a pretty good time for us to dive in on it a little before we get into it deeper later. Michael, what's your opinion on this one? So I feel like it's a much different record than the first Hassles record. That's true. Uh, and I definitely agree with him there. And there's a lot more Billy Joel on it. I think this may have been Billy starting to emerge as a front man, which he would continue with Attila when uh, he and John Small officially left. There's elements here of what I remember hearing on those Cold Spring Harbor demos, like Only a Man. There's some of those like that have some of that organ going on that he used a lot in the hassles. There's some hints of what he was starting to write for his solo career. 
It really is an interesting record, and it, it's funny to me because for somebody that admits to having failed the acid test, it's pretty damn psychedelic the whole thing through. Yep. I do enjoy it. I wonder what my opinion of this would be if it wasn't Billy Joel or if I didn't know it was Billy Joel. You know, like it's one of those things if you just stumbled on this record in a bin in a thrift shop and you gave it a and listen. And knew nothing about it. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it would be one of those things that like, you would feel like, uh, like one of the guys from High Fidelity. You'd be like, oh man, yeah, I found this like obscure, like psychedelic blue eyed soul record, man. It's so cool. You know? Yeah. So it's, it's, I'm trying real hard not to give it like the Billy Halo effect when I was listening to it. Even though it doesn't sound like Billy, I think the part of Billy's personality that's present on this was already his ability Mm -hmm. to sort of mimic different people. I have a running list of just all the artists I was like, oh, that sounds like this guy for a sec. I got Beatles, The Rascals, Traffic, Frank Zappa, Gershwin, Mm -hmm. and I'm sure there were more I didn't even think of. And that second song, The Ballad, Night After Day, between the sort of hippy dippy feel of it and, you know, his early warble, it's felt like the precursor of Falling of the Rain, which in the solo Billy catalog is such a weird song because it's, you know, the the land of misty colored dreams, you know, that whole like almost uh, Cat Stevens kind of thing. It's cool if you know it's Billy Joel and you see it as a precursor. I think if you're into like late 60s uh, blue eyed soul and psychedelic pop, you'll get a kick out of it. I know on the first Hassel's album, there's only two songs that Billy has a songwriting credit on. The first one being Warming Up and the other one being I Can Tell. On that first album of the 10 songs, Billy, actually every step I take, he co-wrote as well. So you've got three of the 10 songs on album number one on the Hassel's self-titled. And then when you get over to Hour of the Wolf, he's got his name, I think, on every song. Yeah, the other vocalists had exited by then, so Billy was handling lead vocals too, which he wasn't on the first album. I think he sings one on the on the first. Yeah, album. yeah, I believe so. John Dizek does get credited for the Hour of the Wolf song and oh, yeah. Further Than Heaven. So there's a couple songs that he's still credited on. And so this was only a year after the first Hassles record, and only two years before Cold Spring Harbor. All three of those albums are quite different. You wonder, with this only being a year after the first album, if they were already on their way to being done. The Attila record came out the following year, so that was 1970. There wasn't too much left from the hassles after this album. And our next email comes from Christian Thompson. Christian and I wax philosophical back and forth on email already (laughs) on this. So what I'm going to read is sort of um, a combination of two of his emails together. So when he just starts talking about what he majored in in college, it had to do with the conversation we were having at the time. But he has a couple Billy related stories that have to do with that. So I wanted to mention that as well. Hello, Jack and Michael. I discovered your podcast a few months ago and have enjoyed every episode. I'm a UK Billy fan. I've managed to see him live three times in the UK over the years, twice in concert, Birmingham and Manchester, once at a master class in London. This came from later, but I like putting it here. I majored in philosophy and sociology at university. One of the only two A pluses I got was for an essay on postmodernism and art using the whole of We Didn't Start the Fire by way of example. I no longer have the essay because it was stolen from the box that we collected marked work from. To this day, I still don't know whether to feel annoyed or honored. At the same university, I tuned into the campus radio one night and heard Mexican Connection being played. I thought I was dreaming, hearing an obscure BJ instrumental coming through the airwaves. I'd like to say I ran across campus and reached the studio before the track had even finished, but I'd be lying. I waited to see what the DJ would actually say when the track was finished. His words clearly indicated that he was a fan. Then I grabbed my cassette copy of Attila, released his brain invasion, and hot-footed it down there whilst the guy was still on the air to see if he had heard of it. He had, of course. I told him I'd seen Billy in 87 at Birmingham on the bridge tour. He trumped me by saying he'd seen him in Philly. No way. Did he play Captain Jack, I asked? Dude, he played it twice, was the reply. (laughs) So, a quick interlude. I wonder if he did play anything twice for Songs in the Attic at the same place or anything to capture it, or knowing Billy and knowing Philly, he was like, Ah, the hell with it. Let's just do it two times in a row. We'll have to look into that. Yeah. So here was the meat of our uh, conversation. He says, I like to think I have some fairly diverse taste in music, but Billy has remained the biggest influence on me since my teenage years through to middle age. His music has got me through some tough times, but I do sometimes wonder if his own romanticism has affected my relationships over the years. It struck me early on that Billy was a sucker for a bad girl. His references to blood are quite visceral and conjure up an almost sacrificial element to his romantic relationships. And he quotes three different songs. He goes with Stiletto, The Wound is So Fresh You Could Taste the Blood But You Don't Have Strength to Leave, She's Always a Woman, Then She'll Carelessly Cut You and Laugh While You're Bleeding, 
and then Laura, then these careless fingers, they get caught in her vice till they're bleeding on my coffee table. Just for brevity here, because there's a lot, although it was a great conversation that we had, he references all for Lena. That's not her style. Big shot, sleeping with the television on. I don't want to be alone anymore. Modern woman and baby grand. All these times when he's kind of complaining about women. Yet in all of this, I've never felt that this is misogyny. It always seems like Billy worships and adores women and that, quote, the only time you hit the high notes is when you are manifesting this devotion. He knows that he does this to his own detriment, blaming himself for his own vulnerability, always hoping to, quote, get it right the next time. I'm aware that Billy is now on his fourth marriage. I don't know if this is related to being in the music industry, his depressive slash artistic personality, addiction problems, affordability, etc. But it does strike me that he was telegraphing his unwise relationship choices in his lyrics from quite early on, and perhaps he was setting up a self-fulfilling prophecy. Wow. I jumped on this late at night one night and, and wrote him a tone back. <laughs> <laughs> back and forth. Did you have any thoughts on this one, Michael? Yeah, he does uh, write about women often. And I think largely it's from a place of affection and a place of insecurity, maybe, where it's him wanting that love, that relationship, and he just doesn't know how to make it happen. I think there's a lot of that throughout his career, perhaps uh, from a, a few places of frustration as well. I jumped on this one in particular because Christian said his music has got me through some tough times, but I do sometimes wonder if his own romanticism has affected my relationships over the years. I yeah. kind of had a similar realization years ago in that growing up on Billy Joel and Billy Joel being the first lyricist that I really listened to. And I think for a long time, one of the only ones that really mattered. Mm -hmm. I mean, I went from Billy Joel to Jimi Hendrix. Hendrix is great, but his, his lyrics are fun. They're a little Dylan-esque and poetic, but they don't have that sort of real world capacity that, that Billy had. Yeah. I found that I also don't think they're misogynistic, although he does get accused of that sometimes. And I think the critics or anyone that says that's being usually a little lazy or taking something out of context or, or not seeing the full picture of what he's saying. But I think where his shortcoming comes in and what kind of got stuck in my brain that I had to kind of like unstick years later is he's got this angle of, yeah, you know, I'm kind of a ne'er-do-weller and I'm a little bit of a schlub and I got my faults, but you know, oh man, isn't it so great that she loves me? It got in my head in this weird way, or as I said, maybe it wasn't the lyrics, but this was the lens I used to sort of fix my approach later on. I was like, well, what do I, what am I bringing to this relationship? You know what I mean? And what was okay. Billy bringing to these relationships? You know, he kind of bitches about the woman the whole time. And then he's like so happy that she loves mm -hmm. him for all his faults, but he never actually <laughs> gives you any indication of what he's doing. Um, like what's he doing to better the relationship? Right. Yeah. yeah. So I pulled up, she's right on time. I'm a man with so much tension, far too many since to mention she don't have to take it anymore. You know, I think that's like the crystallizing one right there. Uh, you look into my eyes, you see the crazy yeah. gypsy in my soul. You may be right. He's pretty much just saying like, hey, I'm a douchebag and you got to love me. Like that's pretty much the theme of that one. <laughs> I just might be the lunatic. Yeah, you're yeah, exactly. For. Yeah. You know, he kind of like makes Lena out to be the problem in all for Lena. But like, oh, come on, he's a horny, obsessed teenager. Like that's on him. That one. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, exactly, infatuation. Exactly. Yeah. That's where I um, kind of picked up on that. I found it to be really something that someone else had a similar thought. Christian spun out in a couple of different ways, but that was our dovetailing moment right there. Yeah, that's a great point. He really doesn't tap into, I've got these faults or the relationship soured. Like, what was my part in that? He really doesn't, yeah. you know, like, and so it goes. He's like, you know, it ended and I'm bleeding. I'm hurt, you know, and it's like, yeah, but, yeah. what'd okay, you do, man? What like, happened? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about the pain, but like, were you part of that? To which I will give two further readings. One would be the only person, as I've said before, and I'll say it again. The only one I know that really writes about how to actually have a solid relationship is Billy Bragg. Just he's so pragmatic and he's so like unafraid to be that vulnerable. He does it. And I think the best example of, of someone to your point, like a song like And So It Goes, you know, where like he just talks about how he's hurt, but doesn't kind of admit to anything. Best example of somebody admitting to it, I think is Joni Mitchell and River. I think she just hits it right there, you know? Oh yeah. Cause it's not easy. The whole like, Talking yourself down, <laughs> that's easy. I think that's like a natural reflex yeah. for a lot of people. But the vulnerability of owning up to 
your feelings truly a lot of artists are afraid to really go there yeah the metallica song nothing else matters on the black album that was the first time they had ever there was any kind of love song ever out of that band and it was a song he wrote for his girl at the time while he was on the road about missing her and loving her and he played it for lars and lars the (laughs) a and r guy in his head is like this is an amazing song we have to do this and James panicked. He's like, this is too personal. He was afraid to do it because he felt that song was so Mm. vulnerable, you know, from the mighty (laughs) Hetfield. And Lars convinced him to do it. And it became one of their biggest songs. All right. So I like these two emails. First of all, because I like that they both mentioned Captain Jack. That's fun that two people emailed us and talked about the same song. The other reason, especially the second one is, you know, we got to talking about Mm -hmm. women and there was also some discussion of Elizabeth Mm -hmm. Joel, who I don't even think we've mentioned her name yet. On this, I think maybe Andy Gill Martin mentioned her in passing. Yeah. And she's been very much sort of written out of the Billy Joel lore over yeah. the years. Which is unfortunate because as we get into 1976 here, she was a major player in keeping his career afloat. And this was the year 1976 that she came to the forefront to do it. So with that in mind, let's get to the main course here and uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll dive deep into 1976. And cue the music. <laughs> yep. I'm already plotting it out of my head. Well, it's got to be Prelude because that's what he was opening concerts with once Turnstiles came out. Would you please give a warm welcome to Mr. Billy Joel. All the audio and video from that Billy Joel Tonight is up on Billy's YouTube. And the first song yeah. of it is Angry Young Man. It starts with some like a, someone introducing him. And I was thinking of using that in the beginning because it's like, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Billy Joel. And it's also the opener for Billy's other big 1976 bootleg slash concert slash artifact, which is his performance at the bottom line in New York, June 10th, 1976. That's a popular bootleg, as usual, you can find it on the YouTube. I think that one's on Amazon as well. Yeah, this was a brand new song at the time on the Turnstiles record. And it just had that frenetic energy to just kick it up right from the beginning. And this was a great song live. And so we'll be talking about that as we go into uh, what's going on this year. January finds Billy about to take his first pass at recording Turnstile. Now Mm -hmm. let's remember, and this is going to be a tough episode to do in the sense that we want to make this about 1976, not just Turnstiles, when there's so much to talk about there. But, you know, if you you remember back to our uh, Street Life Serenade episode, that was the prior year, and it was a flop, and he wasn't very happy with it, and he was, you know, pretty pissed off, and this and that, Mm -hmm. and he was looking to get away from the West Coast sound, the West Coast attitude, and the West Coast, you know, geographically, in general. And so he had a couple weeks allotted at the beginning of 76 to record his next album, which would become Turnstiles. And so the first attempt was during those uh, several weeks in January that he had allotted. And that was going to be at the Caribou Ranch outside of Denver, Colorado, and was going to feature Elton John's band. Elton John had, of course, recorded the album Caribou, so named for the studio. It was slated to be produced by James Garrico, and it was going to be recorded with Elton John's band. Elton John, of course, had recorded the album Caribou, so named for the same studio. And so Billy went in and began jamming with Dee Murray and Nigel Olsen from Elton's band. But this is a problem in quite a few ways. First of all, by his own admission, Billy at that point was already sick of being called the American Elton John. In fact, in Liberty's book, he talks about the the show that year when Billy walks out. Oh, he was opening for the Beach Boys. And he walks out and says, for any of you critics that want to compare me to Elton John and just gives him the finger. And that's how the the show starts with everybody thinking the Beach Boys are coming out. And here comes uh, East Coast Billy instead. And then the other problem at that point was that already Billy knew he wanted to use his live band. Now, the live band he ended up using was the Lords, but at that time, the only member of the Lords that was in the band was Doug Stegmeyer. But he had people like Reese Clark, who had been in the band with him for years, and they were itching to do a record with him, and he wanted to use the guys he was on the road with because, again, as we know, especially from our episode on Phil Ramone, what made The Stranger such a hit, partly Phil Ramone at the helm of it, but also the fact that he knew that he wanted to use Billy's touring band. Mm -hmm. But none of those cards were lining up at the beginning of 1976. Yeah, and it's very fortunate that it didn't go this direction. Although I'd be interested to hear what Elton's band would turn out. 
he would have forever been cemented as trying to be an Elton John if Elton's band did this record, I think. I think it would have shot him in the foot. So at this point, Billy's itching to get back to New York, and his wife Elizabeth is the one that sort of really makes this happen. Yeah. She gets everything set up. She kind of gets him to really make the move, finally, go back to New York. They rent the house yeah. in Highland Falls. Mm-hmm. That's, a, you know, that's an upstate New York, and he said, I want to get back into the city little by little. So they started up there. But one of the biggest, most impactful things she did and long lasting was that she set up home run management. And once they got back into the city, she set up shop in their house. They had a townhouse on East 92nd Street near Central Park. And uh, she turned one of the floors into Home Run Systems Corporation. It was known at that point that she just filled it. They had desks, telephones, assistants, stationery, everything. It was like a full-blown mill out of this house. And it was all for Billy at that point. Yeah, she wasn't going to do anything half-assed. She was going to jump in and really fill out the staff and get the manpower and put the personnel together that she needed to really put the focus on Billy's career. So let's back up a little. I like to talk about the story of Elizabeth and Billy Joel because it's pretty wild. It is. And I think all of us big fans know it, but I didn't know for the longest time and I'm going to guess the casual listener does not either. So Elizabeth, her husband prior to Billy is one John Small. If that name sounds familiar, it's because he has been involved with Billy's career for many years. He was the drummer for the Hassles. He moved with Billy onto Attila. And then as the music video revolution launched in the 80s, he did a number of Billy's videos. That's a pretty rock and roll story. You know, you stole the drummer's wife. And I had mentioned actually before that for someone like Billy who said himself that he failed the acid test, one of the stories, I think he said he had taken acid like two or three times and just had a horrible time every time. Mm -hmm. And one of them was like him, John Small and Elizabeth. And it was just a horrible time. Yeah. They were all living together in New York before Billy went to the West Coast. And John and Elizabeth had a young child together. When all was said and done, long story short, Billy, Elizabeth and the child head out. to to California. And at that point, there was contention between him and Small, which clearly got reconciled over time. But at that point, they just lit out. Right. You know, uh, so like worst comes to worst. And if I don't have a car, I'll hitch. And, you know, I do my writing on my road guitar. Not 100% autobiographical, but it's pretty much... Uh, I know a woman in New Mexico that pretty much was uh, informed by the cross country trip. And so there's Elizabeth, though, in the background of all this stuff. You know, she was the waitress at the executive room, which was the inspiration for Piano Man. She was the waitress practicing politics. She was the person Billy was addressing in You're My Home. That was an anniversary gift to her. A year Mm -hmm. when he didn't have any money, he wrote that song. And then, of course, she was the inspiration for She's Always a Woman. Although it comes after 1976, it's a good way to get us back talking about this because that's a song that finds Billy getting accused of misogyny but really it was so much about him trying to express that yeah his wife had sharp elbows she needed sharp elbows she was already in a really rough industry and she was one of the only women doing it absolutely and it was really out of a place of admiration with her putting up with everything she had to put up with being his manager in in a male-dominated record industry and still at the end of the day you know being a loving wife and so the story goes that Billy played her. She's always a woman. She goes, that's beautiful. Do I get part of the royalties? Do I get credits on it? <laughs> um, <laughs> right. But no, I mean, in all seriousness, you know, you'll read all about her going to bat for him, her making sure he had a budget to go on tour. She had to push for the radio budget. You know, DJs mm-hmm. back then, at least a lot of your freeform FM stations were freeform and they would play whatever they loved. And, you know, you'll hear things like a great interview uh, with Ed Shockey and at WMMR here in Philly from 1976, you know, because he was a huge Billy fan. But, you know, long and short of it still was, man, you needed somebody getting yeah. that song in front of the DJ, getting that album in front of the DJ. There's a million songs out there. They don't know, you know, they can't yeah. hear them all. Somebody's got to tell them. Positioning him just so to get him in front of the right ears at the right time to get the exposure. And you need budget for that. And a lot of times it was Elizabeth going to bat really, really hard to make sure the money was there for these things. And sure, you know, even at the time, the record company pays for the studio time and everything up front. And the artist ultimately pays for Mm -hmm. it out of record sales. But having to essentially record this album twice, I'm sure he was already on thin ice with the label who weren't happy about the expenses. Right. And so the other two shakeups that year behind the scenes was that Jeff Schock became the road manager and Dennis Arfa became the booking agent. And one of the things Dennis Arfa did, which seemed to make a really big difference, was that he shifted Billy's tour strategy. So up to that point, Billy was following probably the more conventional route, which was opening for bigger acts. Right. And you'll hear him uh, piss and moan about this a little, like uh, on that boot from uh, Northampton, PA. 
Yeah. He was like talking about opening for the Doobie Brothers and the Beach Boys. Doobie Brothers, Doobie Brothers, Beach Boys, Beach Boys. And, you know, and then I come out, you know. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's, that's what happened this year when he opened for the Beach Boys. So Dennis spearheaded getting out of that mode where he's not the unknown opener, where people are really just getting impatient, waiting for the headliner to come on. And he started booking him in small theaters so he could build in college up. towns. Right. And in college towns. Yeah. Which he played a lot of in uh, 1976. Mm-hmm. You can see the shift in the set lists that year where oh, he yeah. goes from playing maybe 10 or 12 songs to a full 22 song set. And what's brilliant about shifting to the college market too is college radio is much more free form. Mm -hmm. And I'd be willing to bet that he early on had some better traction in college radio. And that just complimented, you know, the cities he was playing very well. Now, while those were some very important behind the scenes happenings going on in Billy's career, probably the most visible thing that happened was the birth of the Lords of 52nd Street. This was the year that Liberty DeVito, Richie Cannata, Russell Javers hooked back up with Doug Stegmeier to form the classic Billy Joel band. And this was coming off the heels of the initial turnstiles recording sessions with Elton's band not working out at all. Billy was not happy. He just was not feeling it and decided he wanted a New York band. And since Doug had joined him on the Street Life Serenade tour, he was the one guy that stuck with Billy when he moved back to New York. And so he went to Doug and asked, he's like, you know, do you have any guys? Do you know any guys who, you know, drummer, guitar players, anything like that? And of course, Doug, having had the band Topper, which was Liberty, Russell. Mm -hmm. And Howie Emerson. And Howie Emerson. Absolutely. So he's like, yeah, well, I got some guys. And so they set up auditions. And I love the story about Liberty getting the gig. So Billy didn't know that Doug and Liberty were that tight. And Doug slipped Liberty a tape of some of the new songs that they were working on. And so Liberty did what I would do. You learn those new songs. So Liberty (laughs) comes to the audition ready to roll out these new songs. And Billy's like, dang, this guy picks it up quick. (laughs) Not knowing he had a couple days to prepare this music that Doug sent him. It was quick. They were in and, you know, they started recording the album again in February of 76. This time they were in Hempstead, New York at Ultrasonic. And so this was going to be Billy's first attempt at producing himself because he just wasn't happy with anyone he was working with to date. And he's like, well, I'll give it a shot. And before we get into the recording in Ultrasonic Studios, uh, just because we're talking about Elizabeth here, I do love Liberty's story in uh, in his book. So he says, uh, Billy introduced me to Elizabeth as, quote, his new drummer. Shaking my hand firmly, Elizabeth looked me straight in the eye and said, congratulations, you'll still have to prove yourself to me. And ultimately, the way he proved himself was uh, one night they were all out drinking and they dragged race through Manhattan. Liberty versus Elizabeth. Amazing. (laughs) (laughs) So I found some interesting stuff about Ultrasonic. I feel like it's a name in, you know, sort of the Billy sphere gets thrown around just a little and, and you don't think much of it, you know, whatever. That was the recording studio where it happened. It was in Hempstead, which is on Long Island. Interestingly, they used to do a lot of uh, live radio broadcasts from there, which I don't know that Billy ever did one, which is funny because a lot of the good bootlegs that are out there, the bottom line, CW Post, those are radio broadcasts. Right. This is actually weird. On Amazon.com right now for about $77, you can get a bootleg of Little Feet at Ultrasonic Studios, you know, the the radio broadcast. $77 on vinyl, $500 on CD. Don't ask me how that works. But that's what the prices just have. And it goes up to $900 for the CD. That's crazy. Couldn't tell you why. But a couple other notable bands that played uh, at Ultrasonic, either live or track there, were uh, the Vanilla Fudge, Iron Butterfly, and the Young Rascals. And this is where Richie came in, too, of course, because they wanted a saxophone player for at least New York State of Mind. And uh, Billy wanted a saxophone player that also played organ, which, making another note to ourselves, we have to find out how common that was. Because Richie did it, and Billy wanted that. Like, was that a thing back then? Did the sax player often play organ? 
Or was it, you know, a situation where like with Billy's music, you know, like drums and guitar and bass, the sax wasn't something that was playing throughout the whole song. So, yeah, I wonder if that was common to have that kind of utility player back right. then. I always found it interesting, so specific that it was organ and saxophone. And if you watch, at least on the live from Connecticut, he does mm-hmm. have a synthesizer. I don't know what it is because Billy's got the mini Moog and mm-hmm. he's got something else on top of it. But to that point, it was funny. So the story goes, of course, is that Doug's brother was running some uh, recording session and knew about Richie Kanata and recommended him. But Richie comes in the day they're tracking Angry Young Man and he's like, what the hell am I going to put on this? Like he was kind of freaked out. You know, like, what are you going right. to do with this? You know, mm-hmm. but of course they're like, no, we want you for New York State of Mind. <laughs> yeah. So New York State of Mind is the first one that Richie recorded. Mm-hmm. But ironically to me, one of his signature pieces or at least one of his big spotlight ones is one that never made it onto an album. And that's Handball. Handball! So handball was an instrumental that sounds very much yep. of its time. The best analog I can give you if you've never heard it was the, the uh, theme to Night Court, but it's a little cooler than that. Thinking about handball real quick as it relates to turnstiles, because we, we know that it was around that time. Right. And it was part of the batch of songs from that record. Turnstiles only has eight songs. I wonder, and you know, he had done a couple instrumentals before up to that point. I wonder what... What the decision process was in deciding not to put that on the record. It's a great song. We played the Funk Club version of it with Live on Drums. Yeah, 2000 I think it was. Yeah. Sounds great then. Sounds great on the bootlegs we get from 1976. But it does not fit on Turnstiles anywhere. It's so locked in Mm -hmm. that time. That's a good point. You know, you couldn't really say anything else on Turnstiles is really locked into that time period. Funny enough, once Phil Ramone comes in, The Stranger's great, but there's a couple moments on The Stranger where you're like, yeah, man, this is definitely the 70s. But Turnstiles starts off with an homage to Phil Spector. New York State of Mind has like that crooner kind of feel to it. Miami 2017 is just a rocker. I mean, you know, maybe you could say Prelude Angry Young Man is of that era because that follows in the mold of songs like Four Play a Long Time by Boston and right. Funeral for a Friend Love Lies Bleeding by Elton John. You know, that sort of prog leaning, but uh, I'm going to say that's why. And by the time The Stranger came around, there was so much great material to choose from. I'm sure that wasn't even being considered by that point. First of all, by 77, they were firecrackers. I mean, you couldn't oh, even yeah. imagine them doing that. Could you imagine them trying to do handball on like CW Post? Like no. just galloping through everything and then just bringing it down. Cool jazz you know right <laughs> it didn't fit anymore for sure but so maybe when billy comes back that'll be the big surprise at madison square garden <laughs> breaks out handball <laughs> handball again for the first time in 44 years because <laughs> yeah. it was never even a b-side right that never got recorded as far as we know it, no it only was played live that right. was it the only studio recording of that song known to exist is the funk club version yeah after they finish recording turnstiles Billy and the band are getting ready to Mm -hmm. head out on their first headlining tour. Ahead of this, Billy films this great little video for Columbia Records that's going out to the branch offices Mm -hmm. to introduce his management team. Billy in the 70s and early 80s especially (laughs) was always so tongue-in-cheek and just had this vibe that like everything was so ridiculous and so he's gonna not take it seriously and do something silly and that's exactly the case with this video we'll play a little bit of the clip here now i'd like to introduce you to my new management company i was with a different management company at one time no names mentioned but this is a new management company they're new york based it's called home run nothing to do with baseball It's a home run company. Now, I'll introduce you now to my tour manager. You'll be meeting him. His name is Jeff Schock. Oh, hello, Jeff. Uh, The people who you'll be speaking with on the phones and the office, you might be meeting them. I'll introduce them to you now. John. John is our tour coordinator. He also does artist relations. Elizabeth. Elizabeth manages the entire show. Dennis. Dennis is our booking agent. Carol. 
Carol is the general manager. And Sharon is the associate agent. So now you know a little bit about our company. We'll be seeing you in your town soon. Yeah, that, this video is a great uncovered gem. I think it's the only time you see Elizabeth, actually, in anything official, as far as I know. Yeah, yeah. She's always been pretty well behind the scenes. So that's, yeah, that's a pretty rare appearance for sure. If you search the Legacy Recordings YouTube channel for Billy Joel Turnstiles, you'll find it. It's part two of their series on turnstiles. And so what this video is, it's a little promotional video that Billy shot introducing his touring crew, not the band, the touring crew, like tour management, booking agent, and everyone at Home Run to Columbia Records. It was just a little video postcard introducing the label to all these new people in the organization so that when Billy came through on tour, they would already kind of have an idea of who these people were. And this was something that was often yeah. made by the record company, but Billy decided to do something fun himself. And this was the result. I recommend you looking it up because it's pretty funny. The most 70s looking crew you'll see this side of Saturday Night Fever. And not much video footage has survived from that era. So the fact that Sony, you know, it was CBS at the time, the yeah. fact that they've held on to it and preserved it for so long is a real treat it was really fun to see uh, a little snapshot of, you know, mid 76 here. Prior to the album coming out, Billy and the band hit the road for the Turnstiles tour. I'm showing in 76, we've got 51 dates, 44 in America, five in Australia, two in Canada. Mm -hmm. And the first date being March 6th in appropriately Allentown, Pennsylvania at Memorial Hall. Right, and there's no set list out there for this one. Right. Yeah, then he's up in Boston a couple weeks later. Nope, no set list there. Yeah, this is the end of the era where you can't find Billy's set lists online anywhere. Because when did Turnstiles come out? Exactly. Turnstiles was officially released on May 19th. Ah, see, here we go. See, now April 28th is the first one when we get a set list. He's playing Nassau Coliseum, but he's, he's clearly opening for somebody. You know, number one, because yeah. he's playing the Coliseum pretty stranger. Uh, and number two, this is just a 12 song set list. And this is pretty typical of his set list when he was an opener. So here is his set list at Nassau Coliseum. Again, this was April 28th, 1976. We open with Prelude, Angry Young Man, going into Somewhere Along the Line. Then we got Traveling Prayer, Piano Man, Root Beer Rag, New York State of Mind, The Entertainer, The Ballad of Billy the Kid, Miami 2017, Captain Jack, Weekend Song, and Ain't No Crime. That is a solid set list. I like seeing Weekend Song in there. Yeah, I mean, that was even, you know, up to CW Post, that was still towards the end. He was still doing that one. This was the last run that that was ever in the set list, right. really. And he's not closing with Souvenir here either. Yeah, May 2nd, he plays just uh, nine songs. And now for what we're going to assume is his first concert in Australia. This was May 19th at the Sydney Opera House. This mm -hmm. is interesting. He starts with Somewhere Along the Line and then goes into Summer Highland Falls. Ends this one with Souvenir. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, there's a couple more from Turnstiles that make an appearance here. Uh, Say Goodbye to Hollywood's getting into the set list. I've Loved These Days. We've got James as well, which actually James, I believe, was a mm. single in Australia. And the album actually did quite well. This was the first album that really took off for him in Australia. It's funny, remembering back to Street Life Serenade, he said he's convinced that the reason he did so well in Australia is because they did not release Street Life Serenade in that country. And while he was in Australia, he also did a, a kind of an odd interview, and we covered it in our uh, TV appearances episode a few back, where he just seems real pissed off, and he's in a white robe, and so we're thinking it was before the performance. And he's got his sort of uh, Dustin Hoffman and Midnight Cowboy nasally voice going. And, he, you know, it just seems really perturbed and put off by the whole thing. But I'm going to say this about that real quick as I was thinking about this. There's some footage of like people interviewing Ginger Baker and it seemed a little uh, antagonistic uh, on both ends. I, I think at least in the 60s, it was still the old guard interviewing these dirty hippie kids. Yeah. And sometimes I wonder if Billy was like almost doing an impression of that as much as he loves to do impressions is sort of putting on the, the yeah. old, remember yeah. back in the 60s when the interviewer and the subject were yep. at odds if it was rock and roll. Yeah, I can't quite tell. I'll have to look again at the footage 
footage on like how sweaty he is. I don't remember if it's like before or after a show, but I figure I, I feel like it's either one or the other, like right before. Yeah, or right after. he's there in a robe. So that makes me think it's almost like post show house is cleared out and he is like sweaty. So he changes into a robe and then they sit him on stage to do an interview. I don't know. I could be wrong. Yeah. It's a strange setting that usually isn't done. I really think it was before. I couldn't see Billy or any other artist hanging around after a show because they got to tear that stuff down man where they bring a, a camera on there so yeah you know you're right it's probably like after sound check before right doors. right it is cool to see just the fact that it's like the stage with nobody on it and stuff like that and the quality of the footage is great again for something that old there was i'm sure there was some like old school producer like all pissed off that he's in her bathrobe or something you know and then from this year too there's a uh, a second interview with ed shockey from wmmr which is the radio station in Philadelphia from which mm-hmm. the uh, infamous Captain Jack performance took hold, at least in that city, and, and really had an, an early impact on his career. Yeah. That's a real mellow interview, too. Very casual. They talk about like Janice Ian and Springsteen. Oh, remember the time you were up here and Springsteen was here? Yeah. If you find this one, it's 1970. It's two interviews, one from 74 and 76 bundled together, and it's just audio, and it just has the MMR logo. I don't know. I, I, I keep changing all the time. Mm basically think of myself as a musician what and is, i'm going to be eclectic you know you can be as long as i can do you care if you have hit records uh to tell you the truth i don't really care but mm. the record company does because it makes you more visible and it yeah. sells more records and uh, it makes you a more commercially viable product as they refer to you you, know, you can sell more products you can sell more units that more way. units right, right. And by and large, that brings us to June 10th at the bottom line. He played there three nights in June, and the third one was the one that was a radio broadcast. So this is the one that we have the set list for. This is still only a 17-song set. He gets three encores here. Which, as we saw, however, for Orpheum, it was a funny thing where he did like an encore as the first band on a three-band bill, which seemed very unusual. This set list, we got All You Want to Do is Dance, and a lot yeah. of the staples from the last couple tours. You know, somewhere along the line, Traveling Prayer, which pretty much got pushed out by the yeah. Stranger album, you know, as far as live representation goes. I think once we hit the Stranger, some of those early live staples like that started to work their way out. But, you know, on Live from Long Island, Island in 82 he talks about you know new album out and we're not gonna dump too mm-hmm. much on you like you see a lot of the times well he was coming pretty strong here with uh turnstiles quite a few of the songs were getting played yeah so seven of the eight songs from turnstiles are played at this uh bottom line show i mean i guess that makes sense being that it was a radio broadcast what better way to promote your new album than get the whole damn thing on the radio at once this was the first album that these guys recorded with him so right. i think they were all excited to play these songs together live oh, that's a good point that's a very good point so the next notable date i have got on the calendar for 76 is august 9th when billy appears on the mike hmm. douglas show oh right yeah that was the one where uh mike douglas is being a little smarmy with him and billy kind of gives it back your next number is from your new album turnstiles which one is it uh, New York State of Mind. It's for New York City. New York gets dumped on a lot. So I figured it That's needs. right. Not too many people say nice things about New York. It's the most exciting city in the world. I mean, well, it's electric. I just tell people, you know, what, sometimes when we announce the song, we say, uh, you know, we're going to do a song about New York, and you hear, boo, or yeah. I tell people, look, you may not like New York, but you got to understand, if New York goes down the tubes, all those New Yorkers are going to move out there. <laughs> <laughs> Do a little New York state of mind. You know, before you do, this morning, when we were rehearsing, I had a feeling when you walked over and checked out that stage, that that's what you'd really like to do, what Dandy does, to stand up in one thing. I do that during a show. Do you? I mean, I stand up and talk. I don't just sit up there and ignore the audience. I'm like, that's great. Get down and fool around. Okay. We can do a little New York state of mind. Here is Billy Joel. Okay. The first three albums, you know, Close Creek Harbor through Street Life, were all done in LA and all had a bit of that West Coast vibe. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's all gone in 76. He's got the mm-hmm. New York band. He's back home. The New York Billy we all know, in many ways, born in 76. Yeah. And, you know, the more I'm thinking about because you're saying this, I'm, I'm going through the songs in my mind and I, I want to go back to All You Want to Do is Dance because that's the first one where I really think his accent and his New York tone really come through so like say goodbye to hollywood you know he's doing such a uh, phil Spector thing he's in great voice but it's not necessarily yeah. in new york 
but to, but the party is over. You know that whole thing. It's like it's so New York. The way he bounces those letters. Yeah, that's that's the first time that that really really comes through. I mean, yeah. we've identified those snippets of moments like uh, it's tough for me, it's tough for you in uh, Roberta, where it comes through just a little. But yeah, that's the first one, yeah. third song on the album where it just kick really really kicks in. The Turnstiles tour was an interesting one because it was kind of a hybrid of supporting bigger acts. So he was playing the marinas and some amphitheaters, so some big venues. But then you also had the theaters and clubs and the college towns and stuff like that. So it really kind of ran the gamut of what kind of shows they were doing that year, which is fascinating. This was the last time that that happened. Even, you know, by 77, he's still playing colleges, still playing small theaters, but only playing those as as the headliner. Carnegie Hall being the next year. One thing I found fascinating is, was was this was the year he did the Beach Boys? He had done it before, right. but they made mention in, um, in mm-hmm. Fred Scherer's book that he had opened for the Beach Boys at least this year. It was either that book or Lib's book talked about opening for the Beach Boys and uh, people were expecting the Beach Boys That's to come right. out and out struts Billy instead and he gives the critics the finger. It's like they had to have been expecting something else. I mean, there's a piano on the stage. Right, <laughs> <laughs> right in yeah. front. But... What I found fascinating is during the summer, there were quite a few amphitheaters played because I saw like three nights at Pine Knob Music Theater in Michigan. And historically, Billy doesn't play a lot of, you know, they call them sheds in the industry, the the outdoor amphitheaters. Mm -hmm. By the time he really started playing a lot of outdoor shows, he kind of started doing baseball stadiums, football stadiums with Elton John and stuff like that. So he really doesn't play many amphitheaters after this. A few, but not too much. What would you say is the significance about the amphitheaters? Industry-wise, sound-wise, I mean, I don't, I'm not a big fan of them, to be honest with you. Maybe uh, jo- uh, Jones Beach Theater I like. Jones yeah, Beach. but other than that, I mean, we have one mm-hmm. BB&T Pavilion. For my money, always had horrible yeah. acoustics. Yeah, it's tricky. They're bigger than some arenas, because I know the one in Michigan, uh, Pine Knob, which is called DTE Energy <laughs> Music Theater for the last 15 years, but everyone still calls it Pine Knob. And it's always going to be Pine <laughs> Knob to anyone in Michigan, I'll tell you that. I don't know. I think there's just something that people like about like summer outdoor concerts. The open air, it's like a... You know, everyone tailgates in the parking lot, and it's just a big party more than an event, really. It's a totally different vibe. That may be why I don't like it. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm here to listen to music, man. Like, I didn't pay all this money. Yeah. I typically don't prefer them. Bands I see that I like that have great stage shows with, like, lights and different things like that, you really don't get as much of that effect with an amphitheater, you know, especially if you're seeing a show in, like, July or August, and it's still light until 10 yeah, o'clock that's at night. Point. The other big landmark set of shows for 76, I'd say, would be uh, Palmer Auditorium at Connecticut College in New London. Uh, and this mm-hmm. was December 5th and 6th, and it was filmed for a uh, short-lived VHS release called Billy Joel Tonight. One thing I always found odd about this one was just how subdued the audience was, be it the recording of said audience or if they were actually that mellow. It sounds more like a soundboard recording in the fact that there's hardly any audience there. Yeah, and, but even looking at them, they do seem very... A little docile. Yeah, like the hands on their laps, you know, like on their legs, like, yeah. like a school assembly, you know? Like Russia at the beginning of the tour. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> everyone's quiet, just watching. No one's really getting into it. Right, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's still a good show, and it's a great, great showcase. The bottom line's a great boot. Maybe better than Billy Joel tonight, but... Yeah. Billy's on his own turf there. Yeah. You hear that vibe on other boots. What I kind of like about this one is if you close your eyes and imagine just the fact that this is one of the first times the Lords are getting pro shot. It seems very fresh. And because it's, you know, in front of probably a potentially new audience, it's got a vibe like that where they're really showcasing themselves. Uh, and this one has Hambo on it. Yeah. Also has Nocturne of all things. It's only 10 songs. He yeah. was opening for somebody on this one. You know, there was two nights recorded and they only chose 10 songs. So who knows? Maybe Maybe he was headlining and they just cherry picked those songs for it. So this was actually a Time Life video. You remember those? Yep, yep, yep. You used to see commercial for them. The new Time Life (laughs) series. All the time. Yeah, a couple years back, Billy's team cleaned it up and put it up on YouTube. And I'm super grateful for YouTube because we get to see all this great footage. But man, I'm still a physical copy kind of guy. Like do a deluxe edition of Turnstiles and throw a DVD on there of this or something. Yeah, Billy does not go for that. And actually some of these songs made their way onto a promo record that came out the following year called Souvenir, which was an often collected record that was a, uh, they call it a white label promo where the label in the middle is white and the front is just 
a white cover with like a sketch yeah. of Billy and a piano. There's two sides. One side is kind of like a best of studio mm-hmm. up to that point. And then the flip side is like four yeah. or five songs from this show. Yeah, that crops up every so often. Somebody kind of posts something about that. Mm-hmm. And it throws you off too because it's called Souvenir. So it came out after Turnstiles, but it's named after a song on Street Life. Yeah. Just making sure the waters get a little muddier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so the year wraps up December 7th. So just one night after the um, Billy Joel Tonight taping. The last show of the year is showing to be in New Jersey at Montclair State College in Montclair. So he wrapped up um, here in early December for the year. And, you know, from here, so to speak, the rest is history. Uh, 1976 is the year he solidified his management team his band, and his sound. The next year, it was all going to go into the stratosphere. To give you an idea, you know, I remember there was a story, I think it was the member of VH1 Behind the Music, where they were talking about the Turnstiles Mm -hmm. tour was really struggling financially, and they needed like $50,000 to finish out the tour or something like that. And it was Elizabeth with Walter Yetnikoff at Columbia who uh, got it done. You had somebody at Columbia who believed in Billy and Elizabeth was going to do everything she could to get things happening. They salvaged the tour and were able to complete the tour, which was enough, you know, into 77, which culminated in those Carnegie shows, which led right into, as we all know, The Stranger. And so, of course, 1977 and Carnegie Hall and The Stranger, those are all going to be topics of later episodes. So for now, as always... Yes. Let's hear from you guys. Tell us about 1976. Who was there? Who remembers it? If any of you saw him on this tour here, did you see one of the opening slots where he was an opener? Did you see a headlining college show? Yeah. I'd love to hear your experiences around that or even hearing turnstiles for the first time. Or do you remember where you even bought the record? Uh, you know, we'd love to know all that stuff. So please email us. You can find us uh, glasshousespodcast at gmail.com. And we're, of course, on all the socials, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Instagram, you can connect with us there as well. And uh, one more thing I just thought of. I, w- I would love to know anyone that was a fan of Billy pre-1976. What did you think when you went to your next show and this whole new band was there with this whole new sound? Did you notice that it was different? Did it Was it very apparent? Did it shock you? Did you love it? Did you hate it? Did you grow to get used to it? Or did you see it and go, wow, yeah, this is it. This is going to be huge. I'd love to hear from somebody that saw shows on both ends of that. People who are very passionate about a band or an artist often are very defensive or opinionated about you know the band members or the lineup changes and this was quite a significant one and i i would love to see people's impressions were who saw both of them so let us know we'll be here uh we're making a point of reading your emails and comments on the air or on our podcast rather (laughs) all that talk about radio interviews and i think it's 1976 (laughs) yeah you know keep them coming you know your questions and your observations really help spark some cool conversations that we may not have thought of so it's really kind of helping us go in some fun tangents that we wouldn't have uh, necessarily come to on our own so you know you guys are a part of this so keep it coming and with that i'll say we'll see you next time absolutely we'll see you soon thanks Thank you.